Um, I think it was a fantastic event. We had a great turnout, a lot of very interested questions, a very interesting and interested bunch of individuals in the society. So no, thank you very much for inviting us. Simon Kusha is a slightly different firm. We're very specialist. We have one field of expertise, which is what I call top line growth which is topics around pricing, sales and marketing, helping companies grow and make more money. We are a partner-owned and highly entrepreneurial firm, so we're currently in 29 offices around the world, soon to be 30, and we grow on average 15 to 20% every year. Most consultancies grow, but I think we grow faster than most, partly because of our specialism and really uh, our services are heavily in demand. And we'd love to welcome as many applications as we can from LSE in terms of tips. So number one is focus on the cover letter. CVs are all very well, but it's actually very hard to distinguish individuals from their CV. As Simon Kushas, we really look at the cover letter in a lot of detail. So I would spend time on the cover letter, really take time to think about what makes our company a little bit different to the other companies, and then why you as a candidate would be a great fit for that kind of requirement. And through the process, um, there would be a, a video or a phone assessment. Um, I think it's very important to be honest and to be yourself there. Um, and then finally, in the assessment day, there may be one or two case studies. There I think it's a case of maybe a little bit of practice, uh, how you go about answering a question where it's quite a stressful situation, thinking through how you set out your assumptions and work through a problem and show you're working. Uh, but my big tip is to really think about the things that make us a bit different and to gear your whole application around that. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Thank you for inviting us. So I said we're specialists. So our specialism is what we call top line power. So top line, by top line I mean revenue money. Very, very simply put, we help our clients make more money. And that's very distinct from other consultancies who maybe help them save money on the cost side or do big restructuring or buy other businesses or put in big IT systems. We don't do any of that. We're defined very, very simply by working on the revenue side on the top line. We're, we're clearly very different to any other consultancy, um, both in terms of the number of projects we've done and just the depth of experience. So, I so said those kind of four big buckets, pricing, sales, marketing, and strategy. Um, what does that really, really mean? So I said on strategy, it's growth and competitive strategy. So that is, um, for instance, we've just done a piece of work for a London taxi company that you might know, um, because three years ago, when they were bought by a big private equity firm, this company called Uber didn't exist. Pricing excellence. How do I price things better? I think a lot of people think we do mainly like pricing new products. So someone invents something and they say, can you price that for us, please? Probably five to 10% of what we do. The majority of it is repricing things which have been priced badly in the first place. Optimization of prices over time. Um, so how do we increase prices, decrease prices? A lot of work around measuring elasticity. My favorite client, um, Rugby World Cup, so I help them with their pricing and their marketing. The Royal Academy of Arts, um, hotel rooms, mobile phone contracts. This was another popular one, the obvious, obviously, champagne pricing. Um, so, pretty broad in that sense, so rather varied. We were founded in Germany 30 years ago this year, so um, we have a bit of a head start in Germany. Um, so far this year, all going very good. We are 20% up on revenue from last year, 45% up in order entry. Absolutely phenomenal year. Um, every year we have, you can see, is a record-breaking year, so that gets a bit boring. Um, but every year is always higher than the last. Um, so, what that means is, yes, you do project work, because we're consultants and you have to do projects. <coughs> but the projects at least in London, don't just appear on like a magic project tree that grows, you actually have to go out and find them and win them. Which is, that could be writing articles, that could be getting on the radio to talk about things, it could be going to events and conferences and speaking, it could be very simply writing letters to CEOs that have come up in the newspaper because something's gone horribly wrong with their product and you'd be amazed at how many people reply to those kind of things. So everyone is involved in that in one way or another. It's a difficult process, and even if you want to sponsor lots of people, the government don't sponsor very many. We get given a number of certificates of sponsorship every year, um, and we don't have very many of those left at the moment. So um, we take applications from anybody. Um, we obviously take applications, and then we try and funnel them globally if that makes sense. So, for instance, if someone come from the US to the UK because they lost their work right in the US and they've come to the UK where they can work. Um, so we've worked around about that as a company, but it is a complicated process, 
and there's just no guarantees that we can hire as many people as we want with an international background. Management side versus strategy consulting. I don't think there's a real difference. I think that's probably a lot of PR spent on other things. A lot of people say strategy consultants. If you're a strategy consultant, I would put the BCGs and McKinsey's basis well, they're strategy consultants. And they're doing a lot of similar topics to some of the PLOs you're essentially doing, but they're just doing it more. They, they do more than stuff with PLC and most cannot do at all, which is proper C level board and stuff. Um, we put, I mean, I think I'm crystal clear we're in that strategy consulting bucket because we are working on um, specialist topics at a very, very high level in the organization. We are not working on processes and systems and stuff. And that, in my mind, is one of the distinctions that a management consultant is someone you get in because you want someone reasonably clever that can do stuff with down stack computers. Uh, strategy consultant, if you have a specific question, and it's more business level rather than process level. Um, if you've got two years working with some fusion partners, you've got about eight years of doing pricing for a normal human being. So they tend to actually step up and get very accelerated. Now, of course, the trade off is there's, that's a probably a smaller world of roles, but um, I've always been very impressed by the people that leave us where they go. So, one lady who to my team, um, been with the company for four years. She's now got um, head of strategy, head of strategy at um, uh, internet gaming business. Um, yes, yeah, so my experience is the exact opposite. Which actually being specialist makes you far more valuable, and makes people find you out as opposed to being generous. Which means you could do anything, but you might not be able to do much. Yes, we do. It moves very quickly, and what's great is that I guess it's about the future is that we. Um, it's very, um, the hierarchy is very horizontal, so if you're working on a project with Mark, you'll probably see Mark for a, an hour or two every couple of days, would be reasonable. Um, so yeah, no, you get a lot of partner time on the projects. Not, we don't really have a very good fit for public sector. No, so no, don't... Public no, I've never done a project for... A, the government do work for excuse me do work for some not-for-profit businesses so we talked about universities royal academy and things like that but let's be honest that is um probably less than five percent on the whole our proposition is, is rather geared more to the private sector and the capitalist part of society i'm sorry to say so yes we have in the last two or three years hired only interns that have not had a, a, an open graduate kind of intake. Um, and I'll explain that, um, and that's why we're here today. Um, so first things first, when you're hiring people um, for any job, but particularly this kind of job, um, what you can learn in one hour versus two months is very, very different. So the internship at Simon Kush and Partners, and again, I'm probably stealing some of the thunder of these guys, um, what we're not looking for is just some smartish people to do some dog's body work or just to help out with stuff over the summer. What we look at it is the first step as an extended interview process, and that works two ways. We will be doing occasional hiring, but we're not going to be doing any more of this huge open... We were getting like a thousand applications a year to go through to hire three or four people. Um, on top of the interns, it just doesn't make sense for anybody, particularly for you guys applying. I mean, the odds are crazy. Um, so rather we're just moving to a kind of a slightly more throughout the year, just hiring. We're still accepting applications um, from, <coughs> excuse me, from people um, who are graduates. We just don't have a formal process for it, and um, it's going to be a bit more ad hoc. So go ahead, okay. I'll come down to you. Sorry, I'm just interested in like the business finance guy. So you also have a background. Uh, we have physicists, we have a lot of engineers. Um, what about psychology? Psychology? I think we have a psychologist, don't we? A typical project, obviously no such thing as a typical project, but a most typical project, Simon Kusha, is probably 8 to 12 weeks. So we're not doing these monster one-year, two-year programs of work. And typical team, two or three consultants plus partner. So in any one year, four projects? Five projects, maybe. Question about like what should be my advice to the interns to be successful. Um, and the first thing I said is be proactive in the um, Because like I'm working with the interns right now, and every time like, when I look at an intern, I expect you know questions. I expect um, I don't know like some initiative of like uh, 
problem solving and stuff like that. So, and that's what I got from uh, from my internship. So I was thinking a lot of what I loved the most about my internship was how much I learned um, and how really horizontal the structure and design of was. So while I was an intern on the project, um, the director and Mark was also on, on our project, we collaborated a lot. Um, and I was given a lot of responsibility. So I was building the model for the project that I was on, and I was doing that as an intern. And I was so surprised that the model that I built was actually the thing that was presented to the client. So it was a lot of responsibility, and the work that you do is important. Um, and I really, really appreciated that and enjoyed that. When you do an internship for some because you don't really do an internship, you become a, a consultant for the time you're there. So for eight weeks, you are one of us. You are really an integral member of that team because we have work which we've kind of planned to give to you. You fulfill, as, as the others have been saying, an integral part of the project. Um, so yeah, it, it becomes you become a consultant for eight weeks, which is how you experience the job. It's how we get to uh, see how you fit with us. My my internship, I was mine was actually quite glamorous and they're not all like this, so don't all think that <laughs> yours will be the same. I was lucky, so I I arrived and on day one of my uh, internship, I actually got on a flight and went to a place with Bologna in Italy. Um, we were working for one of the, uh, the world's largest producer of kind of locks and padlocks and kind of door handles. So again, one of the most sexist products in the world, but I was in Italy for eight weeks and I did get to eat lots of nice food. Um, the way that works is kind of Monday to Thursday I'd be in Italy and then Friday I'd come back in the office. That was great. So. I get to do, you know, get to be on site, and I get to do the, you know, glamorous travelling and consulting. But then on Fridays, I actually got to be in the office, and the office is fantastic. So I've got lots of friends there. Um, and yeah, so the second day, I was actually in the, called the kickoff meeting, the first meeting of the project. Um, I had no idea about pricing consultancy until the flight there, where the guy, where the partner, actually explained what we were doing on the project. So what we do is, and you don't need. Uh, industry specific knowledge to do it. You find that very quickly you pick up industry specific knowledge and certainly if you are doing subsequent projects in the same industry, a bit of industry specific knowledge helps, but it's absolutely not integral and as I said we, we all just went got thrown in and dependent in the industry we never worked in. We don't know how do you build a model on Excel how, how do you go about doing this? I used to work for a non profit. Um, so I knew nothing about Excel. Um, I was given this, I didn't even know what a model was when one of the senior consultants on my project was like, you're going to build a model. I had no idea what it was. Um, but that's the beauty of these new projects, right? You're always learning new skills. I'm going to be on another project um, tomorrow and I'm sure I will have tons of things that I have no idea. But it gives you the confidence. You gain a lot of confidence. These things can be learned and you will learn them. And that's the whole point of working at a company like San Lucia, right? You learn so much. I was obviously building the presentation. I was involved in all the internal discussions where we were kind of strategizing, I guess. I was also involved in the meetings we had with the client. So we probably had, when we were in Italy, we had daily meetings with the client we were working with there. So that was working through exercises, asking questions. I was very much involved with that. Um, first thing I'm going to say, not on the slide, um, I don't know how typical we are, but when. Um, if you think about how a process at most firms of any scale works, you send a CV and a cover letter. Now somebody has to read those and start making some immediate decisions about do I progress that on any further before you get into then invited for interviews. That's why I send the cover letters. We don't review CVs. Now CVs are very important, so you still need to have one. But in all honesty, all of you guys these days, you're all too highly qualified to distinguish. You're all at fantastic universities, you're all captain of XYZ, you're all on the sports team for this, you're running excellent, you know, you're running this, you're doing the other, you've done an internship somewhere, blah blah blah. Very, very hard. So the cover letter is a real differentiator. I should try a cover letter, picks out some rather key skills in any job, particularly consulting, which is you can communicate. You can write briefly, you can use a bullet point, like a business person. You can make a point and you can back it up with some evidence. You can spell. Core skills. I hate to say it, every other single person is the same. They're really clever and go to a good university. 
take the time to really think about it. What makes you stand out? Why are you different? And thinking about what you know about the company you're applying to, what might they value that's specifically about you? Why this job? Um, again, all I can urge you to do is to have a little think through here about the nature of the business you're applying to, and again, this, what is even remotely unique about that. We tend to try and use a bit of evidence and some facts to say, because. That's a really important word, I think. I think I'd be really good at this, because, as opposed to, I think I'd be really good at this. So, really think through what you know, what you found out, where you've done things you think are relevant. Um, and I guarantee you the most difficult skill in business, but certainly in consulting, is brevity. Being able to say less. It takes a lot, lot longer to say less. My favorite quote, I think it's Mark Twain. If I had a lot longer, I'd have written you a much shorter letter. Um, it does take a lot of time and effort to say less, but it's a very, very important skill. And please avoid the excessively ornate language. I robustly believe that the most enduring feature of my professionalizing, oh, it's like, oh, it's awful, you know. Professional, concise, powerful, much, much better. But, you know, at your stage where you've done a lot of things at school and university, but maybe haven't achieved, you know, 10 years worth of experience in a job, you don't need to say that much on a CV. I wouldn't really worry about that. But I wouldn't ever rule it out. There might be a short online test to do. So I haven't done that for a couple of years. That might come back. There might be a phone or video interview or something like that. Um, and then when you're through that, you get invited in for an assessment day, um, which could have a range of things. Certainly a few interviews, maybe a case study kind of face question, maybe a short presentation. Always a lot of fun. Um, get a tick on the case study because you happen to get the right answer. 99% uh, of people don't get the right answer because often there isn't the right answer. What we're looking for is people that can look at a problem and understand the problem and can work out how to go about solving it. So, the key things to do, ask questions. That's gonna be the very first thing, ask the questions. If you don't ask the questions, you can't possibly move forward because you won't probably be told all the information and chances are you'll just go off the wrong tangent anyway. The questions you ask are, for me at least, often one of the biggest indicators of a smart brain, which is, okay, you've worked out where this is going. Um, don't ask questions for the sake of it. Don't ask questions that kind of, you know, are trying to show off. Like, um, I assume, da 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 da. That's not a question. That's that's just you stating something. But ask sensible questions. State your assumptions. Um, whatever kind of question is going to be, there won't be an obvious answer. So you're going to have to make assumptions. What I personally hate is people that say, oh, God, I have no idea how many taxis there are in London. Can you tell me? Say, well, no, because personally, I have no idea either. <laughs> but how would you make an assumption about that? Let's you know, think it through a little bit. Um, da, da, da. So state your assumptions. It doesn't really matter if they're wrong. If they're wildly wrong or completely odd, that is kind of weird. But you're much better to make one and just move forward with it. Yeah? So that's very important. You can make an assumption, you can move on. Being organized. Disaster is nothing's written down, it's all in the head, and then you can see the sweat, and they're like, Oh, um, the population size, as I said, 10 million or 20 million. I don't know. Be organized. Write it down. Write it down and share it. You know, sometimes people do that quite nice, and sometimes you get that can be a bit trite, a bit weird. But um, write down, you know, population, 20 million. Market share, 30%. 30% 30 of 20 million is 6 million. So just work it through. Um, again, it's absolutely fine to kind of go back to your notes and say, I made an assumption here that don't. Yeah, don't really get stuck into the nth degree. We like kind of 80-20. We'll ask you if we need a bit more detail. Don't go off on tangents, kind of to the point about being focused. Don't freak out if it goes wrong. Um, it's very likely that it's not going to be simple and straightforward, right? Because it's a test. Um, again, it's a test not just of how well you do it, but how you cope under pressure. Um, and Whilst you say that that's ridiculous because it's never the case that you're asked to sit down and do a case study in front of someone while they're staring at you. No, but on a daily basis, including the meeting I was at today, I have a CEO who stares at me because he doesn't understand the data and really wants to go to town on it for a bit. 
and that is a really important skill to ever deal with. So, uh, I've got a question that might benefit some of the members here. So, I was wondering because some case studies are more like interviewer led, and others are more like interviewee led. Yeah. So, I'm just wondering for like some features, how does that work? Because sometimes the interviewer would ask questions, and then the interviewee would kind of try and work that out. But okay. other cases, the interview is quite it's quite open ended, so then the interviewee can answer it, you know, in the way he or he, she thinks. Yeah. I think I know what you mean. So in our world, at least the last few years, the way we've done it is where we've used case studies at this level of recruiting, um, they've been quite closed and quite quite guided. Uh, it's not kind of open conversation and meandering over the course of an hour. It's right, here's a situation, here's some information, what do you need to know next? I don't know which of those buckets of yours it falls into, but um, it's in that kind of close, start, end, finish, do kind of exercise as opposed to meandering thoughts over a long period of time. While online, um, there aren't any shortcuts, I'm sorry to say. Um, you, of course, you're more than welcome to say that you, you were here and, that, and um, you heard the wonderful Mark Village speak and that might help. But, um, so no, while online, um, applications close on the 16th of November. Um, at that stage, all we need to do is a CV and a cover letter. You have a bit of an insight now about how we're going to use those two. Um, we then will have video interviews, something new this year. Uh, this is like, um, there'll be a number of questions we'll ask you to record on a, on a video. Um, and then Successful candidates come for an assessment day, which will be a bit of a mix of cases, maybe presentation, who knows. Um, so that's the process. 